So I think we can get started and um, we have um, a good number of people on, on the line today with us. Guys, let me introduce myself. My name is Praveen Joseph. I'm a cybersecurity consultant and trainer as, and working as part of the Engro Micro Cybersecurity team uh, based in Dubai. And, and, uh, and very, very privileged uh, to be given an opportunity to speak with all of you today, our, our valued business partners uh, over this webinar. Um, we, we, we received a lot of feedback for this webinar in terms of uh, registrations. We got an overwhelming uh, number of registrations and, and this was a very, very uh, telling sign to us about the level of importance that, that the channel as well as the, the region itself is giving to uh, GDPR. Um, and, and like we all know, right, the regulation is going to be in effect from uh, the 25th of May 2018 onwards. So one month and one day is all we have uh, before the deadline hits. Um, <clears throat> but this being said, many organizations are still not um, clear in terms of how they need to go about approaching the regulation and, um, and what are the consequences of non-compliance and how it is actually going to hit them as well. Right. So to fill this gap is why Ingram Micro uh, we have built a, a whole suite of GDPR solutions, and I'm going to talk about that towards the end, um, saving the best for the last, so to speak. Uh, but what we've got lined up for you today is a, is a very, very interesting um, um, session, wherein, uh, let me just show you how, how we got this planned. We've got a quick introduction to GDPR itself. What is a regulation and what is its core focus areas? And then we will we are going to talk about the second section, which is the core, uh, you know, the meat of today's presentation itself, GDPR implementation roadmap. So here we're gonna discuss Ingram Micro's approach uh, where we can work with your end customers uh, as well as with your own organizations to build a practical GDPR uh, implementation roadmap. And from there, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Ingram Micro Solutions. Like I said, the best would be coming towards the last. And quickly, we'll have an update on our activities, followed by your questions. So um, we have 60 minutes, like you're aware of, of which we spent about six minutes right now. So I would uh, try to pace myself appropriately. But if you have any questions at any point in time, feel free to you know, chat, uh, chat into the Q&A window. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that we address all these questions either during the session or after. Okay, so let's get going guys. Let's get cracking with uh, GDPR. Section one is gonna be the introduction to GDPR. And there you have it. Right, guys, uh, before we get started, um, many of us in this room here with us today have, have heard quite a lot about GDPR, and we know what the core focus of GDPR is, which is data privacy. However, what, I, what I've noticed is when we start discussing GDPR, it always makes sense to start the discussion with defining what is privacy itself. Right, so we'll, we'll start with the definition of what privacy is, and then we'll get down to what GDPR is. So in a, in a very, very basic sense, um, Privacy. How do you try to how, how we can try to define it is um, you are aware of what is going on with with um, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal that is that has been rocking the company recently, right? So this is a scandal where uh, Facebook is being questioned uh, by parliaments across the world for not taking sufficient measures to protect the data of their own end users, right? I'm sure you must be aware of the background of this. And essentially, what happened was. Uh, a, a third party app, which many people across the world installed on Facebook, um, was able to successfully steal, um, you know, or not really steal, but access a lot of their own personal data, plus publicly available Facebook information of their connections and their Facebook friends. And then eventually this data was sold by the, by the developer of this app to a, to a company called Cambridge Analytica. Right now, Cambridge Analytica is a company that helps political candidates in their campaigns, their election campaigns. And it is still being disputed, but um, it is likely that this data was being was used um, to, to influence the US elections as well, right, a few years ago. So um, the, the legal consequences of the case aside, the question really is, why is Facebook being questioned so much? Right, so the scenario is very, very, very plain and straightforward to us. We as end users of Facebook, that is you and me as end individuals, when we signed up for Facebook, um, we did, 
you know go up um, uh, come across a privacy policy or a privacy notice um, which all which are which we can guarantee to ourselves the majority of us haven't even read all right hidden somewhere within that policy um, is a clause that you know Facebook would use our data some the way they, they wish or they might even share it with third parties and so on and so forth so technically speaking Facebook does have certain legal coverage in terms of uh, how it handled its end users data but in this particular case it is still being thrown under a lot of criticism uh, because of the, of the way in which the data was divulged to a third-party app um, and in mechanisms that the end users did not uh, not, did not understand or did not even realize to be um, to be very straightforward so privacy is the concept that was breached in this one particular case more than data security right so how we can uh, how we can define privacy looking at this example is um, the extent of control that you and I as individuals the extent of control that we can exercise over our own personal data that is what privacy is. So I'm, I'm all right with sharing my data with a third party company, but how much can I control or how far can I control how this company is using my data, right? So these are, these are scenarios or these are cases um, which have become very, very uh, blurred, especially in the, in the age of the, uh, in the age of e-commerce and data driven businesses like Facebook and, and Google and, you know, um, all the companies of the like. So um, individuals' control over their own personal data has uh, has been at stake uh, significantly, especially since the last you know ten to fifteen years. And um, the European Union, historically speaking, uh, when I say historically, I'm saying all the way back to the fifties, the nineteen fifties. Um, this is one part of the world where privacy has been regarded as one of the most uh, fundamental rights of a human being itself. Okay, in fact, if you look at the regulations which preceded GDPR, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about the 1950s, if you, uh, if you look at it, there was a regulation called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all right? And this was preceded again by other, um, other, other laws, including what we call Convention 108 and so on and so forth. So all of these laws, regulations, and directives essentially recognize that privacy, a right to a family life, um, all of these were to be considered as fundamental human rights itself. Okay, so um, when when things like um, what's happening in the world of Facebook and, and the dot com era today um, are, are actually um, stealing individuals' right to con to control their own um, personal data and and exercise control over their own privacy, this is when the European Union recognized that there was a need for a significant change to their privacy regulatory landscape. Okay, GDPR was preceded by a regulation called Data Protection Directive. Now, the problem with Data Protection Directive is it was written way back in 1995. Okay, so it is more than 20 years old, extremely outdated in today's in today's um, uh, world, and uh, and thereby not ex not extremely eff effective. Okay, against the risks that against the privacy risks that individuals are facing today. So there, the European Commission recognized the need for a massive upheaval. Of the privacy regulation itself and that is when GDPR was proposed. It, um, it was uh, enforced last year itself, uh, I'm sorry, it came into effect last year itself and is going to be um, enforced from the 25th of May 2018 onwards which is a deadline for organizations to comply um, and like, I, like, you, like you must have interpreted from the examples we just discussed, the core objective of GDPR is to give individuals control over their own personal data. All right, especially when you share your data with third party companies um, and, and these entities are what we call data controllers in the GDPR parlance. But the core focus of GDPR is giving individuals control over their own personal data. Okay, so looking at the slide, we see that GDPR is a regulation up here on the top left. Uh, in fact, if you look at the expansion, it says general data protection regulation, right? So what, what I mean by regulation is it has to be passed only by one central body, which is the European Commission. There is no need for every country in the in the European Union to interpret it into their own national law. Okay, the previous, uh, the predecessor of GDPR, which is Data Protection Directive, this had to be interpreted by each member state of the EU according to their own national law. So there was a lot of disparities, a lot of inconsistencies in the way each country approached it, and and of course it made sense for them to for each nation in the EU to. Uh, to tailor the approach based on their own requirements, based on their own circumstances. With GDPR, all this is going to change because across the EU, we are going to have a consistent, you know, um, singular approach towards 
data protection and regulation. So it's a regulation, not a directive. And like I said, its focus is primarily on personal, on the personal data of individuals alone. It doesn't. Uh, it, its focus is on getting individuals to re regain um, their their uh, control over their own personal data. Right now, there are two categories of data within GDPR, which is personal data and sensitive personal data. Um, what do I mean by personal data? What do I mean by personal data? In GDPR, the definition is any data that ident that that relates to an identified or an identifiable individual. This is what GDPR calls personal data. So, if you look at standards like let's say PCI DSS um, or ISO 27001. Um, PCI is focused more on, on focus entirely on cardholder data, and, and you and I know this. All right, ISO 27001 is focused upon organizational data and based upon how the organization decides to rank it. All right, and we talk about setting up an information security management system to protect this data. But GDPR focuses on personal data, and the definition of personal data is, is extremely broad. Right, so any data that pertains to an identified or an identifiable individual is considered to be personal data. So this can even be sometimes an IP address, as long as you're able to tag it through using some of the mechanisms to an individual itself. So data aggregation is a fundamental concept in the definition of personal data in GDPR. Just because it does not directly relate to an individual does not mean it's not personal data. And then there's, an, there's a more critical category of data which we call sensitive personal data. And this refers to individuals' racial origins, religious views, political views, and so on and so forth. There are multiple uh, categories of sensitive personal data. And like you can imagine, right, the, the requirements for protection of sensitive personal data are far more um, advanced than those for just personal data. What is the scope of GDPR? Now, this is a question which many organizations are, are failing to answer correctly. Uh, guys, it doesn't matter if you are located in the EU or you're located outside the EU. That is just one side of the GDPR scope. Uh, even if you're located outside of the European Union, if you're offering goods and services to a European Union uh, customer, or if you're monitoring the behavior of European Union individuals. So when I say individuals, you can either be a citizen or you can just be a legal resident of an EU country. It doesn't matter. As long as you're monitoring the behavior of these individuals, which, which is occurring within the EU, um, it doesn't matter where you're located in the world. GDPR would definitely apply to you. So um, there's also another term, which is establishment. If you're located, if you have a, uh, an establishment in the in the European Union, and you're doing any of the about to activities we spoke about, which is offering goods and services, or you're monitoring the behavior of EU individuals, then yes, GDPR would, would apply to you. you know, the definition of the of the term establishment also has to be looked into with um, with a lot of caution. Um, when I say establishment, it doesn't really mean you need to have an office. It might just be a website. Okay, and this website would, for example, be written in, let's say, German. Uh, it accepts payments from German um, banks cards. It accepts, um, let's say, uh, it targets, let's say, customers from specific um, German audience on, uh, alone. Right. So um, this itself is sufficient for a court to interpret the fact that yes, you have a, su a sufficient establishment in the European Union, and that you are to be certified under GDPR. Non-compliance with GDPR can result in significant fines, and you are aware of this, I'm pretty sure. Um, and this is the one area where GDPR is really, really making an impact, because its predecessor, the Data Protection Directive, it, it did have fines, but these fines were not high. That was number one. And number two was these fines were not significantly imposed as well, or en enforced as well. Right? But with GDPR, the picture promises to be extremely different, because we're looking at fines which can be as high as 20 million euro, of 4% of your total annual turnover. And this depends upon the level of violation. There are two levels, level one and level two. Um, depending upon which level your specific violation falls under, you will, you will be eligible for two types of fines. 10 million euro uh, minimum, and going all the way up to uh, 20 million euro or 4% of your total worldwide turnover. All right, guys, let me remind uh, those of us who've just joined, uh, please, if you have any questions, use the Q&A window. Uh, chat and um, chat your questions away. We are more than happy to have them answered, guys. Um, and and we we really encourage you to type. Them. All right. Now, what are the key entities in GDPR? This is um, this is very important for us to uh, you know lay out straight before we even get into the regulation. 
the data subject on the top left, this is the individual, which is an EU individual, um, and uh, he or she forms the core you know, focus of GDPR itself. In fact, if you look at the regulation, a lot of it has been written in such a way that the people are given more power over their own data. All right. And and GDPR defines a data subject as, like you can see it written here, an identified or identifiable natural person. So when they say natural person, it means all you need to be is a living individual. Right. So that's, a, again, a very, very broad definition. And pretty much any EU individual would definitely be covered under GDPR. That's that's what it means. A data controller and a data processor. Now, let's take the example of a bank in the EU. And um, let's say a data subject walks up to the bank and, and opens an account with this bank. Right, so you, you would obviously have to provide, furnish specific details like your credit reports, your, your name, your address, and so on and so forth to the bank so that they can open the account for you successfully. Right? In this particular scenario, the bank becomes your data controller. Okay, now let's take the example that the bank actually decides to outsource specific activities to a call center which is located outside of the EU itself. Okay, now this call center is going to process data on behalf of the bank. Okay, and this is essentially what we call the data processor, right? So the data controller is the entity who determines the purpose and the means of data processing. The purpose and the means as in the how and the why, right? So the bank decides why I need your data. The bank decides how I'm going to use your data. And then this essentially makes me a data controller. Whereas a data processor down here below, he is an entity that processes data simply on behalf of the bank. So this can be a third party entity to whom the bank decides to share your data for simple activities like, for example, um, phone banking, call center, and so on and so forth. All right. Now, within every EU in, um, member state, there is one uh, supervisory body called the supervisory authority, also known as the data protection authority. Now, every EU member state has an existing organization that, that already is responsible for data protection regulation. And um, for example, in the UK, we have what we call the Information Commissioner's Office. In, uh, in France, there's, there's a body called CNIL, um, which expands in French. Um, so these organizations have been tasked with, um, with enforcing and monitoring GDPR compliance within their own member state, within their own countries, that is. Now, the data controller is accountable to the supervisory authority to demonstrate their GDPR compliance. The data processor is accountable to the data controller. And in parallel, the data controller is also accountable to the data subject, right? So these, these black arrows here indicate the lines of accountability, so to speak. Perfect. So the simple and most popular question is, does GDPR apply to you? And like I said, um, this is a question that many people still have difficulty addressing. But this this flowchart is something that we made um, with the with the hope that it'll you know uh, r remove a little bit of the confusion, right? So yeah, the first part of this says that if you're a data subject who is an EU individual, and like we already discussed, if the answer is yes, then GDPR definitely applies to you. When I said individual, I clarified it meant you need to be either a citizen or a legal resident of a, of an EU nation. That's all. That's all that's required. All right. And in terms of a data controller, this is the example of the bank that we discussed. Um, the bank must have an establishment in the European Union and they should be processing personal data. If the answer is yes, GDPR definitely applies to them. If the answer is no, but they are offering goods and services to EU data subjects who are located within the EU. This is the example of, the, of an organization that is not even located in the EU. They don't have an establishment as well in the EU but still they are located, let's say in China and are still targeting EU customers who are located in the European Union, then yes, you are covered under GDPR. Your GDPR has to be um, uh, looked at by your organization. And also instead of offering goods and services, if you're only monitoring the behavior of EU data subjects, then again, GDPR applies to you. And in today's world, guys, um, in terms of targeted advertising, data analytics, and, de and decision-making about individuals, profiling essentially, right, which is used for um, uh, selling goods and services to people, a lot of companies um, uh, do exist, small and sometimes even unheard of, that are carrying out monitoring of individuals on, on a very, very um, active basis uh, as a core business model itself, so to speak. Um, so, you know, cookies, your mobile device identifiers, your activities on on, on social media, all of this 
um, gets bundled into creating a unique profile for each and every one of us. And, and I'm no exception, uh, and neither is almost anybody in this room here with us today. Um, if we are using any forms of technology, we are definitely being subjected to some form of monitoring or the other. And organizations that are monitoring EU specific individuals, yes, they would have to be covered under GDPR. Perfect, guys. So now we've completed the first section. Um, um, we, we spoke about the what aspects of GDPR and um, why it came about, as well as um, who it applies to. Now we're coming to the core con to, to the core of today's presentation itself, which is a, a GDPR implementation roadmap, a practical roadmap. And up here on your screen, um, this slide that you see, this is the central theme of today's presentation, guys. Now, this is a four-phase GDPR implementation roadmap that Engram Micro advocates and that we have developed for, your, for our end customers as well as for, um, for our partners and as well as for their end customers. Right? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly explain each of these phases to you at a very high level and, and also show you how it maps to the GDPR specific requirements. And then on the next few sections, we'll focus on some of the core, you know, important areas within each of these um, phases, right? So as you can see, there are four phases, assess, protect, sustain, and respond. How, um, uh, how do these uh, phases add up to each other? There's now, I told you that organizations need to start paying attention to privacy of individuals, right? This is the objective of GDPR, getting people to be, uh, uh, getting organizations to comply in terms of privacy. When it comes to privacy, as an organization, what, what, what you need to do is you need to build, maintain, and, and, uh, and monitor a privacy framework, all right? And this privacy framework has to be aligned very, very closely with GDPR. The four phases for building, monitoring, and maintaining your privacy framework is what I'm showing you on your screen right now. Okay, we start with the first phase, which is assess phase. In this phase, we will try to understand what is the environment of the organization itself, essentially akin to scoping. Okay, we understand the organization's um, uh, data processing activities, uh, or, or prior to that, even the business of the organization, the locations, the teams, people, processes, existing technologies and controls, and then what form of data is being stored, uh, processed and transmitted by the company, as well as um, who are the third parties with whom the company is sharing the data. All right, and once the assess phase is completed, we come down to phase two, which is protect. All right, here we start designing the control ecosystem for the organization, the privacy specific controls, and then comes sustain where we are concerned about maintaining the, the privacy framework on an ongoing basis. And lastly, we talk about respond, which is every time there is an activity on the, on the privacy framework that, that requires an active response, we will have to immediately trigger an, act, an action and a workflow has to follow around. Uh, two of the most common areas in GDPR where the respond phase would be triggered is what we're going to see over here. All right, now let me give you a quick explanation about each of the GDPR specific activities in each phase, guys. Like I said, this is the core slide, so I'll have to spend a few minutes on this slide. Um, and on the next few slides, I'm going to focus on some of the highlights and how Ingram Micro can actually help you with these highlight, uh, highlight areas. All right, so let's look at step phase one, which is SS, and, and which is your very, very first step of your GDPR implementation roadmap. So under the SS phase, like I said, your objective is to understand the organization, understand that data processing landscape, understand um, where the entire life cycle of data itself, and then go get ready for the next phase, which is starting to design your controls, okay? So the first and most fundamental activity for this is, guys, you will need a privacy champion. As in, at an organizational level, you need a privacy champion within the company. And this position is what GDPR um, uh, is designating the data protection officer. Okay, so a new type of job title that has been created by GDPR, it's what we call the DPO. Um, the DPO is essentially the GDPR champion of the organization. And he is responsible for building and maintaining this framework that you see up on your screen um, across the enterprise. All right. It has been estimated that because of GDPR, there are currently 75,000 DPO positions in the job market today. And, and uh, privacy professionals are really gearing up um, to, to grab these hotcakes. Okay, how can Ingram Micro help you with regard to DPO? I'll tell you on the next slide. Don't worry about that. Um, so we'll, we'll come to this on the next slide. The second activity on this phase is material and territorial scoping. Um, this is essentially where we understand the business processes of the organization. 
understand what form of personal data uh, it, it holds and as well as processes. And when I said territorial scope, what I mean is which countries is this data being shared with? Do you have third parties or data processors with whom you're sharing this data? And GDPR has specific requirements like you'll see in the next phase about cross-border data transfers. We'll come to this in the next phase as well. So in phase one, we'll try and understand as much about the data flow life cycles. And then we'll try to map it um, uh, in preparation for phase two with what we call the data processing principles of GDPR. Okay, guys, so what this means is in, in not the data processing principles in GDPR, they form the foundational basis of the regulation itself. All right, what, what this says is any form of data that you collect, personal data, it has to be on the basis of specific um, data processing principles. The first principle being it has to be legal. Okay, it has to be lawful. You should not be collecting data illegally or unlawfully because essentially that would be a crime. All right, like for example, you're trying to hack an individual. Okay, that is um, the first principle. Secondly, you should have a, a what we call a purpose specification uh, principle, which is you specify clearly what is the purpose for which you're going to collect the data. And then comes the data minimization principle, which is only the data that you require to meet the specific purpose should you be collecting. So for instance, we, uh, we discussed the example of a person who's op opening a bank account with, um, with a particular bank. Okay, so um, he would probably need to share his, uh, his credit reports, um, his um, name and uh, financial history and so on and so forth. But does he need to share the names of other banks with whom he has an account? Not really, right? So um, only the data that is really, really proportionate to the clarified and specific, uh, specific purpose has to be collected by the company. All right. The next one is consent. All right. This comes under the protect phase. Now in the protect phase, essentially, like I said, we try to identify what is the controls ecosystem of the organization. And from there, we start designing controls. We start um, implementing these controls as well. All right. Now, these are some of the core areas that we need to look at in the, in the protect phase, starting with, like I said, consent. Guys, um, over the past few years, you might have noticed every time you open a website, which is hosted by a European company, um, a pop-up appears telling you, you know what, this website uses cookies. We hope you're okay with it. Please press okay to acknowledge and so on and so forth. Now, this, this message was, um, was being pushed out on websites by companies because of a regulation called the e-privacy directive. Okay, the e-privacy directive um, considers, um, just like many other regulations, and rightfully so, it considers cookies to be a tracking mechanism because essentially that's what they are. Okay, so cookies are small pieces of text files which are uh, downloaded onto your desktop every time you visit a website. And the next time you visit the same website, um, information about your previous browsing activities on the website, um, which was saved during your last session on the website, this information is used to personalize your next visit to the same website. So, you know, many, many, many services today are uh, reliant heavily upon cookies itself. All right, so um, cookies are considered a tracking mechanism, like I said. And uh, GDPR requires that you have specific um, criteria that you, that, uh, that you enforce and you follow when it comes to what we call consent. What do I mean by consent? As an end user, you have a, have a notification that yes, this is your data that is going to be collected by this particular service or product and you agree to it. Okay. Now GDPR states that consent should be specific, it should be explicit and it should be legitimate, okay? It should be very, very clear. Uh, it has to be unambiguous and easily understood by the end user, and it, it should be very, very specific as well to the purpose, all right? Um, there's also a concept called explicit consent, which requires a person to actively check, click on a checkbox, you know, um, click on the tick on a checkbox and then say, okay, I'm all right with you uh, collecting my data here. Here is my explicit consent. For specific activities, like for example, processing your sensitive personal data, uh, which if you remember what we just discussed would, would include your religious views, your racial identity and so on and so forth. Um, these uh, actions would require that the, that the data controller get explicit consent from the data subject. All right, two other important areas, guys, articles 25 and 32, data protection by design, data protection by default and data pseudonymization. All right, now those of us from the security uh, world, we would be familiar with the concepts of security by default and security by design. The same concepts are being applied to the privacy world as well. And GDPR really strongly recommends that these principles be adhered to when you're designing your controls ecosystem. Article 32 talks about data pseudonymization. 
this is a concept which is new newly named in gdpr but the but the concept is not so new to be honest um it's very similar to tokenization right so essentially if i have a token representing every data record that i have as long as uh, the mapping between the token as well as the data record is kept secret i'm free to go ahead and use my uh, tokens uh, with with a lot lesser controls than i would for the personal data itself right so there are a lot of restrictions on the controls if i'm able to uh, invest in deploying a, a pseudonymization solution for my organization all right and of course article 32 talks also about the security of processing which is where your security controls come into the picture and which this again is where ingram microsoft continues to offer solutions um and yes gdpr also requires that we carry out what we call a data protection impact assessment guys this is a a privacy specific risk assessment that has to be implemented by the organization it has to be signed off by this data protection officer and the and the outcome of this exercise is you identify what are the privacy specific risks in the organization what are the impacts of these risks as well all right and then lastly there is also specific requirements on cross border data transfers um like i said earlier right if you have a data processor or any other you know partner um who is outside of the eu and you're going to be transferring personal data over to these companies you'll have to do this transfer only on the basis of what we call specific derogations okay now in within the european commission they have approved a set of 11 countries around the world who are outside of the eu but are still considered safe for transferring data to so you know we have countries like uh, canada australia and so on and so forth and it's okay to to transfer data to these countries but outside of these 11 countries and outside of the european union itself if you're going to be transferring personal data you should have uh, specific conditions called derogations which can which include what we call for example a binding uh, contractual agreement b uh, um, binding contractual rules or bcrs that you sign up with these third parties there's also um, several other derogations including explicit consent i just told you about explicit consent if you obtain explicit consent from the data subject and um, uh, and tell them that hey you know what we're going to transfer your data to a third party country and this country is not one that is approved by the european union are you okay with this explicit consent has to be obtained uh, which means the the data subject has to click on a checkbox for example and then click on okay all right so um these these are the factors that have to be designed itself around the controls ecosystem of the organization to protect the personal data and this is this is what happens in phase 2 All right, coming out of phase three, we are talking about sustenance of GDPR compliance. Essentially, at the end of phase two, the organization should be in a in a state of certification readiness. Uh, but guys, if you look at the picture today, GDPR is a new regulation. It's still not even come into effect. Um, the regulation itself proposes that you know um, certification bodies have to be formed. Uh, codes of conduct essentially have to be written. When I say code of conduct, it's not similar to the codes of conduct that um, that that we would have heard about. Rather, it is the a list of uh, requirements or regulations that organizations have to follow in order to maintain the GDPR or, or achieve the GDPR compliance itself. All right, so we still uh, don't have organizations that are conducting authorized or you know legally valid certifications on GDPR. but organizations have to be in a state of certification readiness by 25th of may this is the requirement all right and failures for compliance guys i told you about this 10 and 20 million euro we'll have a look at that as well failure to sustain our compliance can lead to these fines and and um, if you look at it many organizations are still just waiting to see who's going to be the first victim of of these regulatory fines this year all right so it'll be really interesting to see this when it comes out on the news lastly of course there is a respond phase and this is where you need the organization needs to respond to to for example data access requests as well as breach notification uh, there are specific requirements now let's quickly discuss this guys before we move on what do i mean by data access requests um many of us on facebook we know that we have an opportunity to we have an option to download all the data that facebook holds with us don't pay so this is what we call a data access request now gdpr makes it mandatory that every data controller offer the same service to their uh, customers so if i have a, if i have uh, hosted my data with my bank have submitted my data with my bank i have a right to submit a request to the bank for my data that they are holding with them okay so when a, and and the bank essentially has to build a platform which is probably a web web application or a web form where i can go and submit my request for a data access 
Um, right. So every time a request like this is received, the bank has specific timelines within which the request has to be honored, and um, they have to give the the data subject a copy of the data that they are holding. All right. Now there are many other requests, many other uh, rights as well that GDPR is giving to to, to data subjects, including the right to be right to object to processing. Based on legitimate grounds, the individual can um, uh, can at any time, um, you know, come out with with an objection to his data being used by a particular data controller. The right to be forgotten. Those of us uh, must be from the Google, uh, who are familiar with the Google case, must be aware of this term, right to be forgotten. Um, right to request transfer of data, right to data portability, and so on and so forth. So a lot of new rights are being given to data subjects itself. And, and the organization has to, has to have a mechanism through which it can at any time respond to data access requests or any other data subject specific requests. And then comes articles 33 and 34, which talk about breach notification. This again requires active response. The moment you detect the fact that you've been breached, you have 72 hours to notify your supervisory authority. Within 72 hours, you have to share this to the DPA or you're looking at significant fines. Again, like I said, 10 million euro is the category under which this would fall. All right, so guys, now quickly, let's take a highlight, a look at the main highlights within each phase um, and where, G, where Ingram Micro can help you. Um, uh, starting with phase one, which is SS. Like I said, we need a DPO, which is a data privacy expert or a champion for GDPR uh, employed within the organization. Now this position can also be outsourced in case the organization does not want a full-time uh, privacy expert. But two of the most important certifications for a DPO to hold guys, these happen to be what we call the CIPPE and the CIPM. These certifications come from the house of the IAPP, International Association of Privacy Professionals. And Ingram Micro actually offers these trainings guys so if you want to hit the market and talk to your end customers and tell them guys are you looking for dpos and there are seventy-five thousand dpo vacancies in the job market today like i told you um the best certifications that a dpo need to, needs to demonstrate are these two and i'm not saying this myself this is based on a study from the oxford university of uk um, that the most relevant certifications for a dpo the most valued as well happen to be cippe and cipm and we have certified trainers offering these trainings as well. So the IAPP does not allow um, uh, entities to train un unless they are certified themselves. So Ingram Micro is certified and we are offering these trainings. Um, our trainers are, uh, hold these designations as well to offer these trainings to the market. All right, uh, phase two is where we spoke about protect. Um, we spoke about data protection by design, data protection by default, as well as data pseudonymization, which is similar to uh, tokenization. Essentially, how we would uh, go about defining this would be um, understanding the data inventory, data flows, and life cycle, uh, charting with the entire data life cycle uh, uh, map, and then from there, understanding the existing controls ecosystem and start designing new controls okay, with, with privacy by design, privacy by default concepts in mind. Also, designing areas where we can apply tokenization or data pseudonymization like we just saw. All right, so Ingram Micro, we have consultants within our team, GDPR experts who are actually able to go on site to the end customers locations and 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 develop these you know activities for them and implement them as well all the way up to um, um, the, the certification readiness phase all right on phase three the highlight was the fines like i told you we have uh 10 million euro for violations like the breach notification that i told you about 72 hours right so if you if you fail to stick to that timeline you're looking at a significant fine of 10 million euro um, and also 20 million euro for violations in areas like for example consent that i spoke about as well as data subject rights cross-border or international data transfers all of these violations fall under level two which is 20 million euro or four percent of your highest worldwide turnover whichever is highest okay so um significant fines guys but the moment you um you realize that you you may be uh, culpable to a violation um, it's, it's never all that straightforward, right? You always need some handholding. So for instance, um, let's talk about breach notification. You need to verify the fact that yes, this is a breach. This is, this is challenge number one. You need to verify the fact that yes, data subjects are going to be affected by this breach. This is fact number two. Okay. Now GDPR allows certain, um, exemptions as well on breach notification. So if, for example, your data has been pseudonymized, I, sp I spoke about data pseudonymization. If your data has been pseudonymized and if that data has been breached, right, then this means even despite the breach, the risk of this breach is not likely to occur because it's only the pseudonymized data that is lost. Um, the actual personal data is not compromised. 
All right, so um, it's not necessary that just because data was breached, it has to lead to you know a negative impact on the to the rights and freedoms of the data of the data subjects. In these cases, certain exemptions are allowed by GDPR. So the organization would need an expert um, that they can consult. They will need expert advisories uh, so they can decide on uh, whether they need to notify the incident or not. And of course, time is of the utmost essence because they only have three calendar days, which is 72 hours. <clears throat> if they decide that they have to report the incident, what are the activities? What are the details that have to be reported? All right, these will include factors like what is the types of data? What are the types of data that were breached? Um, when was the incident detected, of course? Um, what is the root cause of the incident, if at all it is available? So a lot of aspects have to be reported in the right way to the DPA. And, and the DPO essentially has to front end these conversations. We, as GDPR consultants, we can actually support them in building these conversations and building these communications and deliver it for them as well on an ongoing basis. Okay, so this is exactly one of the areas where we can help in the sustained, in the sustenance phase of, uh, of uh, the privacy framework. And lastly, we're talking about response, the response phase. Again, data pro um, the data protect pro processor has to notify the DC immediately if they detect the fact that they've been breached, as well as the DC has 72 hours, the incident management um, services of that, that I just spoke about would be of utmost value here. Um, to make sure that you you are able to report the information within the specific timeline itself, and like I said, if the breach does not cause any significant impact to individuals, you might not have to report it. But at the other end of the spectrum, if a breach leads to a high risk to a data subject, you might have to report it even to the data subject itself. Okay, so a simple example is the Equifax hacks that uh, the hack that happened last year. Um, a lot of 143 million citizens only in the U.S. were affected by this by this major cybersecurity breach, and um, uh, essentially this was a breach where individuals were facing high risk, okay, because a lot of their financial information, their SSN numbers, and a lot of sensitive data, data was breached and it was out there unencrypted for for hackers to use, right? So this is one example where a breach would lead to high risk to data subjects, and the data controller had to notify the data subjects. I'm not saying Equifax came under the purview of GDPR at that point, but within the GDPR, in, in a GDPR um, regulated world, um, breaches like Equifax, they are going to get uh, notified far more often because um, their own data subjects will be notified of the fact that they've been breached. All right. Guys, so this was it about the GDPR um, uh, implementation roadmap that we have. Um, we went through four phases just to quickly summarize. And within each phase, we looked at where exactly uh, Ingram Micro can help you. If you have any questions, let me remind you again, guys, please chat them away. Um, we already have a few right now. Okay, asking us for slides from, from Salem. Um, Salem, I'm, um, let me let me let me get back to you regarding the slides. Any other questions, guys? Okay, thank you. All right, guys. Now uh, we are almost coming to the to the end of the session. But quickly, these are the Ingram Micros GDPR solutions that that we discussed at length throughout the session. The training is where we can immediately collaborate with you because, like I said, seventy five thousand DPO vacancies are are out there and this number is only growing. And uh, so this is a really, really a, a piece of low, low hanging fruit that we can quickly grab, right? So we have three levels of trainings, guys. The first one being online trainings or web awareness series. These are free trainings, guys. Um, we have two sessions, which is the GDPR foundations and the GDPR implementation training. Foundations talks about the what and the why. Implementation talks about the how, all right? And then we have the paid trainings, which is a CIPP Europe as well as the CIPM trainings that I told you about. Okay, so these are the most essential certifications for a DPO to hold. Then comes the consultancy services, which, which is where we have a, our own security and privacy consultants. These, we will actually as a team come work with you, through you um, um, as your own employees, as your own representatives also, with your end customers and bring them up to a level of GDPR certification readiness. All right, so there is no GDPR certification officially as of, as of now, let me be really clear on that. Certification bodies have to be formed and this is gonna take some time. Uh, the regulation is, itself is coming into effect only on 25th of May, by which time everybody has to be ready for certification, right? So this is where we can help you and your end customers. Um, the, we have a whole suite of services, including the GDPR implementation services, 
the readiness assessment or gap assessment and of course data smaller activities like classification of data risk assessments implementation of dpia data protection and practice system incident management support all of these come in from four to seven they come in as a subset of, of bullet point number three gdpr implementation all right so anything that needs to be done on the ground with regard to gdpr we have the experts and um, and we are more than happy to work with you regarding this all right technical assessments these are cyber security related technical assessments like you saw in the previous section security still remains of a core focus of gdpr in fact article 32 of gdpr is focused on data security in addition to synonymization that we spoke of so your ongoing security cyber security maintenance activities will still have to be you know top notch there is absolutely no exceptions on that that gdpr allows so your our services for cyber security technical assessments still remain uh, valid for this particular requirement of gdpr we have remotely delivered vulnerability assessments penetration tests uh, web app scans um, managed security services as well and there's a beautiful free service that we offer called the public discovery report guys if you haven't heard about this i'll tell you in a couple of minutes but it's a it's a lovely way to start a security conversation with your customers all right i'll, I'll come up to this to this in one of the next slides all right, guys, um, like I said, the most important certifications for a DPO, I'll re reiterate this, CIPP slash Europe as well as CIPM. These come from the house of IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, which also happens to be the most reputed privacy organization in the world. Okay, And um, it's similar to ISC Square in the security world. right? So um, they have developed, they manage these certifications. And like I said, they require the trainers as well to be certified. So you get really, really credible, authenticated, sorry, um, a credible and authentic certification, uh, certification training from us. Each training is two days only. So each certification is two days. So within a week, we can train on both of these. And um, as part of the, um, um, the training sign up, you, the employees, sorry, the students also get a voucher to take up the exam. Um, they get one year membership, free membership for IAPP, um, as well as an access to an online portal on IAPP where they can do e-learning of, of all the course contents as well. There are, there are very, very beautiful e-learning modules involved, included. Um, and, and, and so a whole suite, a whole, whole lot of other resources from IAPP membership as well. So there's a lot of value to be derived every time you sign up for these trainings, because like I said, the exam voucher is built into the, in the training itself. All right. Um, that's it, guys, with regard to our GDPR solutions. Um, <clears throat> a quick update on what we've been up to uh, from the Ingram Micro Cyber Security team. Our website is at security.ingrammicro.com, guys, and you, you should probably be knowing this by now. Feel free to um, check us out over there, especially the resource center. Um, where we have all our white papers, all our previous web webinar recordings. A lot of useful content is up there. Our YouTube channel is also available. Just search for Ingram Micro Cyber Security. A lot of our webinars, presentations, conference talks, all of these are available on our channel. Do feel free to check them out. Also, the free trainings that I told you about GDPR, the online trainings, their recordings are also available on the YouTube channel. Okay, so um, most of the contents that we discussed today, if you want a detailed, um, you know, understanding of them, feel free to check out our trainings. They are up there for free on the, on the YouTube channel. Um, we are really active on social as well, including Twitter. Um, so please keep looking out for our uh, updates and posts and our monthly newsletter. This is one of the um, one, one of the most biggest value adds that we are actually adding in terms of a monthly cyber security newsletter. Very, very useful news articles and um, you know pieces of snippets. In fact, last month we had a uh, we had an article on the GDPR implementation roadmap itself. This month we're gonna have something on the dark web. So a lot of exciting stuff happening on the news on the newsletter. If you haven't received it on in your inbox. Please first check your junk, and if it's still not there, just give us your emails um, so we can add you to our, to our database. All right, we meet with partners such as yourselves on an ongoing basis, guys. We do cybersecurity as well as privacy enablement sessions, um, explaining to you what we can do for you and identifying with you where we can actually work together. All right, um, PDR or public discovery report, this is what I told you we'll discuss towards the end of the session. Guys, like I said, this is one of the best tools. Um, in fact, I like to call it the icebreaker because it's one of the best tools to start a security discussion with your end customer. All right, all you need to do is give us the name of the customer and this is public information, the name. And with just the name, what we'll do is we'll look for publicly available information of the customer 
that shouldn't really be there. All right. So, for instance, if you if you look on job posts, for example, old expired job postings, and this is available on sites like LinkedIn and so on and so forth. Sometimes these posts uh, end up giving too much information about the company itself, right? So, when you're advertising for a job, uh, things like this particular successful candidate will report to so and so entity. He'll be responsible for managing so and so clients, so and so processes, so and so uh, infrastructure. So, when things like your client names, the types of um, hardware that you have, the the kinds of servers that you have, uh, whether it's an Oracle server or um, or whatever it is, you know, these are pieces of information that can help towards a larger attack on an organization, right? So where, where, when you start your reconnaissance phase uh, in in penetration testing, a cyber criminal would start by looking in posts like job posts or or any other publicly available uh, data repositories, and this is the kind of information that your customer would definitely not be happy. Uh, seeing on public forums, right? So we look entirely only on public forums. This is a completely non-intrusive check, um, and it's completely free for you because we want you to start these conversations with your end customers. Start talking about security. Okay, so um, when you go to them with with this PDR report and show to show it to them. Um, the, the first question they ask us is how do we fix this? All right, and this is where we open the door for bigger cybersecurity opportunities with your with your customers.